you have many problems in physics and math where the idea that you want to build some function which satisfies some constraints. So you have a function f of x, and you have some c of f equals zero, or should be larger than, but let's say equals zero to simplify. And this type of problem uh, are extremely easy to solve uh, with machine learning. And uh, I mean, not say easy, but it's it's a nice problem to solve. Our guest today is Dr. Harold Urban. He is a theoretical physicist at Institute of Theoretical Physics in Sacle, Paris, who works on string field theory, string compactifications, and uses AI methods to solve the cutting edge problems in string field theory. He is also an author of the most recent book on string field theory. So let's start our conversation with Dr. Urban. First of all, Dr. Urban, welcome to the podcast. It's nice to have you. Thanks for the invitation. It's uh, very nice to be able to speak here. Okay, so. One thing that I want to ask you, I think this is the first thing that I will want to ask you is that, so one of the fields that you work on is string field theory. And a lot of people, who, uh, even those people who are familiar with string theory and its formalism are not very well versed in the formalism of string field theory. And many people, I've seen that many people don't even know that why do we need string field theory to, you know, uh, solve some problems. So if I uh, ask you that, okay, so can you tell me in, you know, some brief words that, what is string field theory and why is it needed? Then how would you respond? Um, so, so I would first point out that most of uh, modern physics is uh, written in the language of PFT. And one of the very few exceptions to this is string theory in the Rothschild formalism. So, you know, if you look at condensed matter, particle physics, cosmology, basically every modern physics is QFT except string theory. Uh, so to me, it's kind of a first good indication that we should strive to 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 move to a QFT language for string theory. And the point is that we know very well that first quartized formalism have a lot of limitations, um, which we don't have in second quartized, which was the original motivation to move to that uh, to second quartized or QFT. And I think it's why, like, I mean, and, and many of these problems are visible in string theory, even though like with Riemann surface and um, you know, to DCFT and so on, we can bypass most many limitations, but we still have fundamental limitations like being on shell, not being able to use analyticity and so on. So it's why I think it's important to use QFT because we just can have a wider perspective of uh, about the theory. So if somebody says that, well, uh, I do uh, know that in, in string in string theory we have uh, you know this QFT like structure on on the world sheet then isn't string theory itself QFT? Um, so, so it depends what you mean by QFT. So indeed, you, you, you recover QFT uh, effective action if you compute scattering amplitude and so on. Uh, the word sheet itself is a QFT, but it's a 2D QFT. So what I want to say is that we want to use a QFT for the strings themselves. So, for, so the fundamental object of string theory of strings, so we need to write a QFT of strings. and you know, in other formalism, like we will also get QFTs, but they are other type of QFT. So it's like if you do uh, part, uh, particle physics, you could write everything in terms of uh, word line. So you will start with a 1D QFT, which is just quantum mechanics here. So you can quantize, try to compute scattering amplitude and so on, which can be useful for some applications. Um, and you also get an effective action in space time, which would be like standard model and so on. But the dynamics itself of the particle is first quantized, so it's not a QFT we will. Uh, so I think it's here the fundamental difference that we the QFT we want is for the strings, not like other description of the effective dynamics and so on. So correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, most of the QFTs that people are familiar with, uh, in those QFTs, fields are local, so they are you know localized at a single point. But in string field theory, the fields are not localized, they are more like functionals, which are, you know, uh, associating numbers or, you know, functions to, uh, you know, uh, paths in space-time. Is that true? Yes, exactly. So so it's one of the big difficulty with string field theory that it's not a theory like a QFT like we're used to, which just functions, but as you say, it's functionals. Um, so I would say for me, it's one of the also interests by, by itself why I want to study string field theory is how do we write QFT for functionals and not just object, because you could think that it would be useful for describing some specific type of matters like in condensed matter, 
as effective theories, or you can even think of, about writing a membrane field theory because we don't know how to do uh, like word volume formation for membrane, but maybe we could write directly uh, a QFT for that. So it's a kind of question like I'm so just intending, like how you write a theory of extended duplex which are from for which the fields are functional. And um, so yeah, so so it's in, in this regard, it's very different. On, on the other hand, if you just do a Fourier expansion, and so for extended object, you can do two Fourier expansion, one for the center of mass, which is the same as you do for particle physics, I mean, local fields, and one for the extension. So at the end, you just get mods, which are just normal fields in space time. So, so I think it's also a very different perspective, which is not really put forward in many papers and books. I mean, so there's not many books, but in papers and reviews, because it's not useful to do research in some sense. I mean, you don't really derive new results immediately. Uh, but I learned this with Ashok Sen when I was doing this lectures in uh, 2016, which is to think and think literally not in terms of functional, but just as a bunch of space-time fields which are local in momentum space. So, okay, you have an infinite number of fields, but the fields themselves are, are local and just the one you are used to working with in QFT. So if, if you take this perspective, you can, um, much more directly understand string field theory and how it works by just doing this map. So, because of these, uh, because of this this huge difference between uh, you know local fields and the fields that you use for string field theory, are there some mathematical techniques that we need to use to study string field theory which are not used in studying local quantum field theories? Yeah, so so here again, the question is depends a bit on the perspective. If you take a more like effective perspective and you don't want to write all the details, uh, you don't need other tools. And here it's something which was very useful for proving things like unitarity, crossing symmetry, and soft theorem and so on. Because here you just look at the fields you have uh, in the action. So you do your full expansion, you get many fields, but then you can just use immediately standard technique from QFT. Uh, you just need to be careful because you have exponential of box factors, so they might diverge. So you, this you need to be a bit careful. But overall, it's, it's uh, it, it looks like QFT, behave like QFT. You you are a bit careful with this exponential of box, but it, it's not that different. So if you don't care about like the numbers and details, it's fine. Now, if you want to compute really, like amplitudes and extract numbers, uh, then you need to to understand how you, you, you combine the three together. And, and here it's very different from compared to particle physics, because if you have a normal QFT of, uh, with function field, I mean field which are function, uh, so you need a way to like take a product of this field. And by product, I mean kind of generalization of inner product. Um, so by this, I mean, if you take end state in your Hilbert space, you want to be able to associate a number to that. And if you just have function, it's easy. You take your function at different points or uh, with different momenta. Uh, you integrate over all the points and momenta you have. And here you have a you have a number. Now, if you have a functional, how you do it? Because if you have a functional, you need a way to combine dif different functions. So you need some something which eats and functionals and gives you a number. And here it's much more complicated uh, thing like this. And um, but but. So this point of view, okay, you can kind of bypass it if you write string theory in terms of worksheet uh, formalism, which is what we do in practice because we don't know how to do without. So if you move back to the worksheets, then Riemann surface gives you a way to to just uh, like directly get this kind of map. And and when you go through the worksheet, you can really see a direct parallel with normal QFT because you can also rewrite this uh, normal. QFT of local fields in this way, where you just have some object which eats and fields or end states and give you something. Um, so, so, if, so I think it's also again this this uh, normal. Uh, I mean, QFT of local fields can give you some ways to understand like this map, but clearly at the end, the object you get for string field theory are much more complicated. You know, when when people are studying. Um, non-abelian QFT. So this question uh, is a bit technical, but if you can make it simple for, you know, um, uh, well, beginning master students or, uh, you know, advanced undergrad students, that'll be great. So when people are studying um, non, non-abelian QFTs, there is this kind of symmetry that they study, which is called the BRST symmetry. And there is also this action that comes with this particular symmetry, and it's kind of a general action. 
Uh, but the thing is that this action goes with some assumptions that you have, you know, this particular structure for the, for example, the uh, commutator of the generators, for example. But in when in, when you study string field theory, there is this action that comes up again and again, which is called the BV action. So can you describe what are the key differences between the BV action and the BRST action? And uh, why is BV action required in the first place to study string field theory? So... So one of the, um, I, I think the simple, so, you know, with BR, when you have BRST, you introduce cost also. So the way you get BRC is that you take your gauge invariant action, uh, you gauge fix it, and then you see that you have this BRST symmetry, and so you introduce a ghost uh, to make it explicit, okay? So the idea of BV is just to, to take the ghost, but introduce them at the beginning before you gauge fix. So, so in some way, like if you start with BV and you get fixed, you get some BRST action in principle. Now, the, the point is that BV is much more general, so you, you can get something which you cannot get necessarily with BRST. Um, so, and, and here, I think one of the base cases I learned about this is the second volume of Weinberg, because it, it does BRST and BV in a very general way. So, it, for example, it shows how you start with a young maze and you get fixed and get BRST. But then he explains that in fact, this, you can write a more general BRST action. Now he starts with this also BRST, he goes to BV, and then he tells you how you can get a more general BV than what you got. So I, I like these ways to try to, to see how you move from by step to get the most general formulation of uh, QFT, which is BV. Um, so, so the main difference, to, to go back to your question, is with this idea that you get GOSP already at the beginning. and, and and it gives you much more like uh, control about your action and uh, like the gauge invariant in general. And one point is that when you have an action, um, for example, for which the gauge symmetry has some peculiar property, which happens when you have gravity, you know, so not just string theory, but even if you try to quantize um, uh, normal gravity you, you, or super gravity, you will find BV. Um, so, so yeah, you, you, it, it's kind of needed when you have special properties for your uh, commutator. For example, if it occurs only on shell, then you might need BV. Uh, you also need BV if you, if you uh, like if the, if after gauge fix, fixing, you have a residual symmetry. I mean, a, a better way to say, if the ghosts have a, a gauge symmetry themselves, then you might need BV also. Um, so I hope it was simple enough and... Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and is BV the most general action, or uh, can you even generalize it even further? Um, so, for what I know, I would say BV is the most general. If you don't have an open system, then you have this uh, Schlinger Kegish formalism and so on, which are, I mean, a bit related to BV, uh, but I think, but I'm not sure about this. Uh, but for a QFT with a DC patient, I would think that BV is uh, the most general action. I see. I see. Uh, and one more thing that I um, want to talk about, because uh, this 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 particular topic is kind of very close to my heart. And, uh, you know, uh, this topic is also kind of well known outside the string theory community as well, because uh, this uh, topic is actually used for some of some of the criticisms on string theory as well. Uh, but it, a lot of people don't know that this uh, problem can be. Uh, you know, solved in string field theory. And that's the problem of proving the background independence, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, in string field theory, there are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, in string field theory, there are, uh, you know, some proofs that do prove the background independence for a large class of, uh, you know, theories, or, or sorry, a large class of backgrounds, actually. Um, and the thing is that, uh, first of all, do, uh, uh, why do you think that this particular fact about string, string field theory is not uh, you know, very well known in the community. And secondly, uh, you know, I think this should be the, this should have been the first question that I would have asked. The question is that how do you even define background independence? Because I've seen different definitions of this word. Uh, yes. So, so, so for our first question, it's um, I, I would say overall people in our community are very allergic to string field theory, and most people don't want to hear anything about it, and they don't know why it is useful. Um, I think it's even like a widespread opinion. I mean, until recently, at least, that uh, you cannot do anything that you can do, cannot do with watches. So, like, string theory is just useless. Uh, so, this I don't think it's true. And it's because 
people like uh, are, are not really aware of the literature, which is also not written in a very accessible way if you don't know string theory already. But now the problem is that is there, there were no good reviews or lecture notes or anything to learn string theory. So it's kind of, you know, like chicken and eggs. You cannot learn string theory easily, so you cannot read the literature, so you don't really know what is there. And I think it's one of the main problem why people don't pay so much attention to it. And in particular, background independence or other results like unitarity and so on. Um, so now the, sorry, your second question was, uh, well, how do you define background independence? How because define, um, yes. I have seen different definitions of this word. So, so to me, background independence is uh, whenever you can write uh, the action of a theory or the path integral without making reference to any fixed background. So one example of this is that if you take normal particle physics and you write the Lagrangian of the standard model, you need to use the Minkowski metric eta. So because you have this eta, which is a fixed structure, um, and by structure, I mean some fixed field, I would say it's background dependent. Um, you could imagine also like some condensed matter system where you have some electron and you want to put some external electric field. Uh, the field could be dynamical, but to, to write the theory, you need to start with some fixed field. So it's background dependent uh, in terms of this. Um, so now, for example, in string theory, when you do the worksheet formalism and you fix the CFT uh, in more in general or background, so when you say, okay, I have this KBO or this uh, this flux and so on, it's all fields which are part of the da data which you fix, and then you will look at small fluctuation over that background. This is background dependent. Um, now to give a so, so okay overall, as you see, I think it's easier to kind of give example of what is background dependent and what is not. Uh, one example which of background in the man is general relativity, because if you look at the action, um, and by this I mean the einstein hilbert action, so if you look at the action, so integral of R, yeah, you don't need to define anything in advance. You just write it, and the, the, the possible background will be given by the solution to the Einstein equation. But until you go for the solution, you don't need to know any of them. Like you don't need to know Minkowski exists to write the einstein hilbert action. For the standard model, for example, you need to know Minkowski in advance. So, so it's this difference right. that what do you do you need to know the back, the solution for your field in advance or not? Um, and it's even more than solution because you you can you could also in principle use a North shape background, so which is not a solution, but so you need to write something for for Einstein Hilbert, you don't need anything. But but someone may argue that uh, even in general relativity, you are at least the, the thing is that uh, for most approaches to quantum gravity, people expect that we will discover that space time is not fundamental, and they say that if your theory is assuming that space time is there, then your theory is not background independent. So what do you say on that? I mean, general relativity does not have this feature; it assumes the existence of space time at least. Um. Yeah, is this, I think, you know, it's philosophy, and I think it's mm -hmm. very important to think about a general question like this, but I, I would say for now, we know too little to, to get, to take a strong stance. I mean, we can take a strong stance personally, mm -hmm. uh, as one people, and decide to work on one theory or another because it has this feature or not. Um, but as of now, I don't think we we know enough for sure to, to, to reject a theory because of this. So, so saying that you know, we assume space-time, uh, to me, it's not sufficient. Uh, and yeah, I think it would be nice to be uh, to really see space-time to emerge and so on, but then it would emerge from something else, which we have no idea now. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, I, I mean, I clearly agree also with some people that it's one of the points I'm uncomfortable with string theory and uh, and uh, Lacan theory, that you, you start with the dynamic of the strings, you see space-time equation of motions, but you still have the strings which need to to be there in some sense. So I I would really prefer some, you know, some action from which you see that excited states or space time containing strings. But uh, now right. we don't have this. Well, but but, but there are some uh, arguments in the first volume of Polchinski that you can write down, uh, you know, the different background metrics as coherent states of strings 
right? So in that particular sense, uh, can't you say that, okay, space-time is not fundamental in string theory, it's a coherent state of strings. Yeah, I mean, I think in fact you could also say something like this with gravity. Like I know some people work with ideas that you can write gravitational background as coherent states, and, and mm -hmm. like it was very popular with the sitter, for example, because you know like the sitter has some problem at the quantum mechanical level. Uh, I, I'm still uncomfortable with ideas that you 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 start with the coherent states, but of strings, but you start, so you start with a theory where you say strings exist in some space time, because it's how we describe the dynamics now in the watch sheet or even string field theory. But then you say, okay, this space time is a current state of that thing we started with, which live in space time. So it's kind of a bit circular, uh, which I'm not so happy with, but I don't have any good explanation. So maybe it's what happened at the end, but I don't know if it's with strings that will, will you know, form the current state exactly. I, I'm not sure, but. So, uh, so to sum sum it up, when we say that we can prove the background independence in string theory, it means, you know, the, the, that the definition of the word background independent is what what you said in the start, right? That you don't have a metric in the start of the theory. So, almost, so you, we need to distinguish two types of background independence. So the first is mm -hmm. uh, one we call the explicit, like in general relativity, where we just don't need to specify anything from scratch. And I think it's very ideal, and many people who are against things here would say that it's what we need. Uh, but here again, it's an assumption. Like, okay, I also think it's more beautiful if you can do it, but we don't have any big principle telling you that it must be like this. The second solution is if um, you have uh, like implicit background in the so you, you you need to write to use a background to start writing things, but it's not important. And, and so this how you can do it is that so if you change your background in your action, so you do a field redefinition. Uh, sorry, if you change the background, you can show that it's a field redefinition. Uh, one example of this in uh, normal physics is uh, if you take general reality, which you expand on some metric. So, you know, you do G hat plus H and H is small. Uh, you get a cell which is explicitly background dependent. Sorry, we, which looks like it depends on, on the background. But you can show that it's just uh, independence is implicit because you you know you can always go back to Einstein and do another expansion. Um, it happens that string theory theory is this type of theory, and and the main mot main reason is because the string uh, states are fluctuation above the background. So now mm -hmm. the string is not like uh, let's say a full part of, uh, like it's not the graviton; it's a fluctuation of the graviton if you look at the spin to fluctuation. So because this, everything you do with string theory, we give you fluctuation above the background because we start with the background always. So so we will get a theory which looks like uh, general relativity expanded on some background. So the only chance you have to show background independence is indeed to show that if you change the background, it's a figure definition. And it's what uh, Ashoksen and Barton Sviber could prove uh, first for the bosonic string and then the super string. So right. it's a more limited um, background independence, uh, but it's still there. I see. And uh, uh, so uh, for, for the people in the audience who don't know, the, uh, there are some uh, different sectors in string theory, which are known as the NS NS sector and NSR sector, RNS sector and RR sector. Mm -hmm. So do we have uh, a proof of the background independence in all of these sectors or are some of the sectors not done yet? So, so even Montenegro, you could even say like we have open and closed string, and mm -hmm. we have also so bosonic string and super string. Um, so for the open bosonic string, so the which was built from Britain. So here the uh, background independence is uh, uh, quite easy to show, and in fact because of all this work on classical solutions. So, so for the theory, you can compute analytic solutions. Uh, so at um, even non perturbative so you don't need to take the string coupling to be small. Uh, so, so you can compute the solution. You can do a sh uh, shift the background from, for example, Minkowski to one of the solution, and you can show exactly independence. So, so as we see, this is the strongest independence which was shown in string field theory because you can just shift by a finite background and it it works. Um, then for the closed bosonic string, it was done in uh, 96. 
Uh, so, so here uh, you need to take a small deformation. So the, the uh, uh, people could show that you can add many small deformation to get a large deformation, but but still like the step is a small deformation. So it's more constrained compared to open bosonic thing. Um, now, if you look at the theory of open and closed bosonic string, so where you mix both, um, I don't think there is a complete paper uh, proving the invariance with all the steps and so on, but there is some like indication it should be there in a paper from Barton Siba. So, so this, sh I, I assume, is also fine. Now, if you move to the super thing, so first, it doesn't really matter if you're in the NS or Ramond or a mixture of them. Uh, in general, if you can do for one, you can do for the other. Um, so for the open super string, I don't think uh, people will study it, but uh, yeah, this I'm not aware about paper we're discussing it. Uh, but I assume it will not be too hard because, so what's that is you know, when you mix gravity and the brain. So if you just have one, it's kind of fine. If you mix both, it's a bit harder. Um, then also what, what has been, so then what was proven uh, in 2017 by Ashokshan was a uh, background in immense for the closed super string theory. And, uh, and now that's so. So I know some people and for example, myself are interested in doing the full like open closed super string field theory, uh, but it has not been done yet. Uh, but a priori just technical details, like there is, there is no, mm -hmm big hurdle to, to do it. I and um, there is a small also addition to background independence, which I think is important, is that, so you often feel that, so you have this string coping constant. In fact, it's not a fundamental parameter of string theory, which I think is important to highlight because you know, one thing which is nice with string theory is that you not have independent parameter. Like alpha, alpha prime is just a conversion uh, factor. Then you have GS, the string coping, but the string coping, in fact, it corresponds to the background. Uh, so the expectation value of what is called the ghostly latent state, which is a state which is not often discussed in, in books and papers. So I think it's a, uh, it, it's a very peculiar state. Uh, and, and, and so the, this is not so well known, but, but this string coping constant is just the expectation value of that. And background independence should also require that if you change the string coping constant, you should get uh, be able to compensate this by a field redefinition. And because the background in string theory is redefined by the value of the uh, string coping and the other fields. And importantly, it was proven uh, by Barton Schreber uh, for the, uh, and Bergman and other collaborators for the boson X things that indeed it's what happens. So if you, you can like the string coping is really just part of the background definition. So this has not been proved also already for the super string. Um, so I was working on this at some point and uh, put this on the break. But but again, it, it should just be a matter of uh, you know working out the details to to show it. And and you will need both things to to show the full background in the band of string theory. And this you know sh should happen. So, so you you're saying that uh, you know and these remaining things don't have a big hurdle to be done. So they are just technical details to be filled in. Yes. I, for the ghost dilaton, sure, sure, like, I really don't think it's, uh, it's difficult. Um, like, there's some small subtleties. Uh, but, so, like, for carrot for people who know a bit, like, uh, the super thing and super thing theory. So, the main point with super thing theory is that you have the Ramon sector. And to be able to write an action for this, so the Ramon sector has kind of a safe zero constraint, like, type to be super gravity. So, it's hard to write an action for that. And if you write an action for that, um, then you have some complications which make it harder to do the same proof as you had for the bosonic thing. So you need to be a bit more innovative, but like this has been understood. So so now it's just working out the additional details you get. Um, so yes, and for the open cause uh, super thing, uh, yeah, I don't I don't think there's uh, any big principle which would prevent you to prove it, but uh, it's not clear to me how to proceed uh, either. I see. So there is this um, formalism by Nathan Berkowitz no, known as the pure spinner formalism. And uh, can we formulate string field theory in that particular formalism? 
So, so I'm not uh, very familiar with plus minus. I can just say the, the very basics. But uh, to, to wind back a bit for, for the reason is that so if you start with the worksheet string theory, uh, so the usual formulation is called the R RNS. So RNS puts super symmetry on the worksheet. So you have this 2D QFT on the worksheet, and you want to, to have super symmetry there. Now the point that when you look at the states in space-time, uh, you need to impose some constraint to recover supersymmetry also in space time because it's really at the end what we want. We want supersymmetry in space time, but RNS doesn't gu guarantee this. Um, so, so it's something, so it's called the GSO projection and it makes your theory consistent. Now you could try to do the opposite. You could say, okay, I want to have supersymmetry in space time and see what I get. And, and here you get the green Schwartz uh, form reason. So Green Schwartz is a completely different way to write the worksheet, uh, but you can show that it gives you the same state as RNS. And uh, the main way that you cannot do, uh, so okay, I'm not also very, very familiar with this formalism, but you can do some co more computation um, easily, but uh, I think you cannot compute like uh, quantum effects with uh, Green Schwartz. Um, so, so okay, you know, you, you have a trade-off between the two. Um, now the idea of Berkowitz is uh, to, to introduce pure spinner was to improve about this green Schwartz formalism. So to use other worksheet variables, uh, which are built from pure spinner, which are so spinner with a specific constraint. Um, so so you can do it for the work grind, for example. So so okay, okay for the work grind you can do exactly the same of all this. So if you start with a you, you want to describe a set of supersymmetric particles. Um, I mean, fields. You can also start on the word line. You can have a RNS for the word line. You can have green words, or you have pure spinner. So it's just completely equivalent ways to formulate all this. Um, so, yeah, so in, in this string theory, you can also have this different formulation. You can pick any you want, uh, okay, after you have proved that uh, they are equivalent. Um, yes, and so to for the second question, that can you do this? Can you use it in string field theory? So the answer is yes, because the point that so string field theory you have two. How can I say? So okay, in any QFT you have two formulation in some sense. You have the QFT you can write from first principle, which is what we do with the model standard. So we use the symmetry, the the field, the representation, and we just directly write the, the QFT. And then you have the second quantized formulation, which is what we did people did in the originary to, to derive QFT. So you start with the first quantized formulation, you do your second quantization, and here you get a QFT, but the field is expanding in terms of first quantized state. Okay. So in string theory now we just have this second quantized formulation. We don't have a first principle QFT. So everything we do in string theory is going back to worksheets for computation, for characterizing the state and so on. So once you go back to the worksheet, you can just use any formulation you want. So you can use RNS, but you can use also pure spinner. For what I know, I don't think anyone will try to compute things with a pure spinner in a string theory, but uh, nothing will prevent you to do this. Um, and now in some way, like a string theory, just something which tells you, okay, if you want to compute some amplitude or some, you know, some property of your system, how you do it to make it completely consistent? So to remove divergence, you you be infrared and so on. So it will tell you, okay, if you compute this, you know you will get a wide defined answer. Now to compute that, you need to go back to worksheet and this you, there you can use any method you want. I see. I actually asked that question because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the utility of this pure spinner formalism comes out when you have to compute in the presence of these fields in string theory called the ramon ramon fields. Uh, so I was thinking that may, there may be some place in string field theory where you have to deal with these fields and their pure spinner becomes useful. So is that the case? Um, I think it, it should be, yes. Uh, so, um, so okay. So I think um, also very in general, like uh, pure spinners are very useful to do computations of string amplitudes. Um, so, so I would expect to, to see them more often uh, for uh, also writer for general computation. Now, in for Ramon Ramon first, we don't really know how to compute them with RNS. 
but we can compute them with uh, pure spinner. So I don't know the details. It's just you know general knowledge people say. Um, on the other hand, something you can do. So so one of the difficulty with uh, uh, Ramon Fox is that you cannot write a worksheet CFT for them in RNS. Now, if you start with pure spinner, somehow you can. So this I don't know the details. Um, but something you can do in string field theory, so, so the magic of string field theory is that you start with some background, but as we know, you can just deform the background to something you want. So for example, you can define your background to include Ramon, Ramon. And, and here the upshot is that even if you don't know how to write a CFT in practice, you know how to deform every data in string field theory to compute as if you were on the CFT background. So in string field theory, you can mm -hmm. add Ramon, Ramon, this has been done. Um, and, and so, okay, in that case, you cannot, you, so it will not tell you exactly what is your CFT, but you will be able to compute things in the presence of Ramon Ramon Fox using the original back, uh, background, so the CFT without Ramon Ramon Fox. So for this, you don't need pure spinner, for example. I but see. I can imagine that with pure spinner, you can do maybe even better, but yeah, I'm not very familiar with that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so now I want to discuss uh, your work, which involves machine learning, with because that's something that I'm quite intrigued about. Um, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so the story goes something like this: that if you uh, so in string field theory, you have an infinite number of interactions, right? And in the case of open strings, you can write them down as a simple cubic interaction. I think it was done by Witten. Um, but the thing is that if you try to do that for closed strings, there is this, uh, you know, no-go theorem by Sonoda and Zweibach, which says that you cannot do it. Uh, but that assumes that you have only one field, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But if you add auxiliary fields, you can probably do it. Uh, so some of your work, uh, you know, goes in this direction and you try to use machine learning to guess the, these, you know, vertices for open strings, right? So, and, and one more thing is that you use machine learning to guess the data uh, of something that we were talking about before of the background independent side that includes these, you know, model spaces of Riemann surfaces. Um, you, you can, you can also, you know, uh, share with the audience why that is relevant for this problem. And you also, uh, you know, guess the data of something called the BV algebra on the moduli spaces, right? So, uh, what is this program that in, you use machine learning? And the main question that I want to ask you is that what where exactly is machine learning helping you in this particular program? Yes, so, okay, so it's uh, a lot of questions. So do my way if I forget something, just let me know. Um, so so in as, um, as you mentioned, like one of my main interests in string, the string filter is to compute things with, with it. So just scrap something which gives you numbers. Um, so that we can understand it better and we start to compute, you know, loop correction and so on, but uh, with real numbers and without any divergence. Um, now the problem, so, in, so we have this infinite number of uh, interaction in the action, and this infinite number of interactions come in the same, from the same origin as if you start with general relativity. So general relativity is just one term in the einstein hilbert action. But if you expand the metric, you will get an infinite number of terms in, for the, uh, involving the fluctuation. So string factor is the same. It's because you have fluctuation, you get infinite number of terms. Um, now you, you, you need to, to understand this different term. So, so what is one term? So as we saw, so one vertex, so a vertex of order n is something which take, takes n states or n fields and gives you a number. So the value of the, I mean, the interaction for this, the states. So it's kind of computing the overlap, um, of the different states given just the fundamental interaction corresponding to these endpoint things. So for example, if you take just particle physics and you take the X field, uh, you know, we have a five, four interaction. So it will tell you what is the overlap of four X fields as a, like just at one point of space time. Uh, so you, you want to characterize this for string theory. So we have this big vertex function. Um, so now this vertex function, you have two, two aspects. So as you say, you have a background independent part and a background dependence. So why do we have this two? So, so the background independent is just because we know that we have to, to take some functionals. Uh, so we have to, 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 to uh, 
kind of so it's in not the proper way to say so so we have something which describes the fundamental physics of these interactions then we need also something to which starts with uh, so we, we work with first quartile states as i mentioned so we need something which takes as first quartile states and turns them to a number so it's why we have these two parts so for the background in the bar, so we know that so strings are one-dimensional objects. So they will have a two-dimensional worksheet. This worksheet, when you have many strings, they will correspond to remain surface. So now different processes will correspond to different surface. And all in a common surface which are possible correspond to so um so sorry. Remain surface are characterized by some parameters. So for example, if you have some holes, you have the size of the hole and so on. Uh, if you have uh, external states, you they are characterized by where the external state is inserted on the surface. And so now all the different processes will correspond to different values for this parameter. So they have different size of holes, different size uh, price of insertion and so on. And all the inherent values are called the moduli and the space accessible for this value or is a moduli space. So for example, if you take the three, so the, um, an interaction with three states, uh, just at classical level, the remain surface is a sphere with three points. And here it happens that there is only one way for, for this to interact, so there is no modulus, and the modulus space is just you know the uh, points. Now if you take four strings, which can interact, um, the modulus, so, the, the idea is that uh, for some mathematical reason, you can fix three of the states, and you just have the last, the fourth state, where, which can be inserted anywhere on this on, on the sphere. So the modulus is the position on, on the sphere of the uh, fourth uh, state. And there is a mapping which tells you that this uh, is characterized by a complex number. So the modulus space of the four, four uh, point amplitude at classical level is just C. And without going into the details on the, so the uh, interaction on the classical level are given by spheres with n punctures, uh, so n points, you can fix always three of them. So it tells you that modulus space of, uh, at classical level are like C n minus three. Okay, I, I, without going into the details. Um, now the point, uh, okay, so, so, so you have this data which is there, like it just, describing you how things will interact. Like they are remain your face, so you, you know it should be there. And it doesn't make reference to any background because it, it does like a geometric property of string watch it. Um, now the second point is that, uh, so so when you work off shell, so, which we need when you have an action, um, you cannot just directly insert the string on your surface. So you need to define coordinate patch and you need to make one patch correspond to one external state. And you may need external uh, additional patch uh, in case. So, so this data is not physical because it's just a way you parameterize your surface, but you still need it to write the action. The, the idea is that it's, uh, it's how you can completely characterize intention uh, with offshore states. Okay. Um, so you have this data. Now, when you have this data, it will tell you how you can compute correlation function for some states, which are represented by first uh, quantized states, uh, so in the reverse space of the worksheet theory. Um, and, and uh, okay, so, so you compute your correlation function, and, and this is something which will give you a function in terms of the modulus, moduli, and that's all, and of, of the external like, quantum numbers. And, and it's here that you need this background dependent part, which it, which goes through the worksheet, you need something which turns your, your Hilbert states to something which just depends on quantum number and moduli, so the, you know, with fundamental properties of the process. When you have done this, you need to sum over all the possible process. So for example, when you have four strings in interacting, you know they can come like this or like this, I mean, with different angles and so on. So this sum is implemented by the sum over all the, so the integral over the moduli space. So you want to, to really consider all the different process and because the parameters are continuous, it's like an integral. It's a bit like if you do, uh, you know, five cube theory, you need to sum over STU because you have different ways to do it. Here it's a bit similar, like you sum over moduli space to get all the different process. 
Okay, so it was a long uh, introduction to just say that we need this to this moduli space, and we need the so-called coordinates to describe string amplitudes. Now the amplitude is not like it's it's really giving you the full contribution, but we don't want the full contribution to write the action. We want the contribution of like a localized interaction. So for point particle, you can always like look at interaction at points. I mean point particles uh, with local models, like the standard models. So so interaction will be like phi x to the power four. Okay. In string theory, because strings have an extension, they, they will never like Collide at one specific point of space time, but you need to look at a small region in some sense. So, so what we want to do is to revise the string amplitude in terms of a contact interaction, and by contact we mean happening in a small region of space time, and things which look like strings colliding somewhere, for example, here in some small region, then some, one string propagates, and then there is some other interaction in something else. So we have Feynman diagrams with propagators. So we want to split the two things. Because if we know the fundamental interactions, then we can build everything when we know the propagator. Again, like in QFT, if you know the vertex and the propagator, you can write the amplitudes. So, so we go back from, from the string amplitude, which has a sum over the full moduli space, to the interaction. And, and you see by this process that, that the interaction should not have a sum over all the moduli, but over a smaller subspace. So the upshot of all this is that to describe the interaction, so the string uh, vertices in the action, you need local coordinates and some such space of the moduli space. And in principle, the way you, you could bridge this iteratively is that you start with a cubic interaction. And the qubit vertex is directly the, cu uh, the cubic amplitude because you cannot have any propagation. When you know the cubic vertex, you can look at the Feynman diagrams, which are like, you know, STU, so like this. Um, it will give you uh, how cubic vertices contribute to the quartic amplitude, and whatever remains is what you call the quartic uh, vertex. So, for example, here, if you take the open bosonic string from Witten, what you find is that nothing remains. So, you don't need more interaction, you just stop the process here. Now, for the closed string or the super string, you need more interactions, so you have many more. Uh, okay. So, so here we see that so a string vertex is something which so you need a correction function on the CFT um, to remove the like to move from the CFT to some function, and then you need the interior over the subspace. So the program uh, we need to to achieve is to we characterize this all this information uh, for as many orders as we can. So here again, what's important is not with the CFT part because the CFT just you know something you you get from CFT, so 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 it's completely separate from string theory. So I would say it's less interesting now to to really understand the the CFT, in particular because for simple string theory like just on Minkowski background, it's a free CFT, so we know how to compute everything. So so the CFT is not the difficult part, I would say for now. The difficult part is really to obtain the subspace of the moduli space and the local coordinates. So you have this iterative procedure, but you but it, it doesn't really tell you how you can do it at any order easily. So you need to just, you know, do it do, do cubic, do quartic, and so on. So it's a bit painful. So something we are striving for is is finding some general principle which can build the vertex at order n immediately. So that you, you you know it's it's uh so kind of some canonical parametrization. So here there is one. I mean I would say there are three canonical parametrization. Um, the most well known is the minimal area uh, formulation from uh, Shiba. Um, so because here it's kind of uh, it's uh, it has very nice properties. So for example, uh, uh, if I remember, it's minimizing the coefficient in the string effective action. Uh, so it's kind of giving you the smallest coupling constant you can get, so effective coupling constant you can get. Um, it's based on the very deep principle of Riemann surface. Uh, you can also build the vertices at any n. So so it's a nice formulation. So it's a good starting point to try to to tackle this problem. Uh, more recently, like uh, another formulation was done, which is called the hyperbolic formalism. Uh, 
so for example, here, someone who worked a lot on this is uh, Atakami Hirumi Firat, uh, who developed a lot of tools to, to try to construct the vertices. Um, so, so it's another formation, a bit more general, and for at least at the classical level, you can recover the minimal area vertices in this way. And then there is some hint that you could also try to do this with SL2C from a uh, function at least at the classical level. So, so you have a few like attempts, uh, but the only one where you can really do co like parameterize the vertex at order n uh, in a quite explicit way is the minimal area vertex. So it's what you start with. Um, so I will make a small break here in case you have any question or comments. Well, uh, uh, not really, but uh, one thing that I want to ask is that, so as you said before, that uh, in order to get on-shell amplitudes, you need, you know, uh, the modular space of the Riemann surface, and then to get off-shell amplitudes, you need, uh, you know, Riemann surfaces with coordinate patches. Uh, one thing that I want to ask about is that, so to get, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but to get string field theory, you need these geometric BV algebras. So what are these geometric BV algebras and how do you construct them on the moduli spaces? Yes, so um, so BV is characterized by some um, by some brackets. Uh, so, so you need a bracket and, um, and you have also like a second order uh, differential operator. Uh, and, and so given this, your, your, your action satisfies something called the master equation. So it's like, delta of s, so where delta is your second order differential equation, plus bracket of s with s equals zero. So if s satisfies this, it's a quantum master action. And and it, and like the general theory of BV tells you that, okay, this uh, action is uh, has very nice property, like you know it's uh, consistent at a quantum level and so on. Um, now it happens that you can define a BV algebra, so which uh, which has also a second order operator and some bracket on model space of Riemann surface. So it's giving you some some way to like take two surfaces and get a, one surface. And so the bracket of two surfaces is something else. And and this bracket, in fact, corresponds to some specific form of gluing surface. So so if you take uh, you know two Riemann surfaces, you can try to glue them together. Um, so, so the bracket is defined in this way. Um, the second order differential operator is kind of adding some end dog on your surface. Now you can lift this bracket, I mean, this operator action on the full, I mean, on some space of surface, you know, some set. So here, the way you do it is that you just look at all the possible combination on both sides. Uh, so in this way, you can define the bracket on such space of modeling space. And now the, the once you have defined these different operations, you can show that there is some algebra which, I mean, satisfies it, uh, so that this operator defines a BV algebra uh, on the surface. And and the way you would see it is that so, it's so, okay, this green, so, you know, I mentioned that you have Feynman diagrams uh, before in one specific type of gauge, uh, the Feynman diagrams are given by, so if you take two surfaces, uh, the propagator will just look like a tube uh, for the clustering. So the tube is parameterized by the length, which is equivalent to the proper time of the finger parameter. But then because it's a tube, you can also have a twist here. Now the BV algebra, in fact, it just in you uh, so the how you implement this is by looking at going of surface with only a twist. Okay, so so I, I don't really want to, to go into the details of why this is what we consider. Um, a simple way to say that this, so uh, if you look at a moduli space, uh, as we saw, we, we want to identify which part give you a vertex uh, of your action and which part correspond to graph with propagator. So how do you characterize the boundary between the two spaces? So the boundary is given by, by a gluing, so by a propagator of zero length, you know? Because if the propagator has zero length, it, it, you, you cannot really say if it's an interaction with a, a propagator or a contact interaction. And so you should be able to, to start from that boundary and then increase the length of the propagator to move in the propagator region. So, so, so it's very interesting to know this boundary region. And the boundary are really given by changing the twist 
but not but taking zero against propagator. And in fact, it's what generates this BV bracket on surface. Mm -hmm. So so you get this BV algebra. And also the point of this string theory that you um so which you mentioned earlier is that you will have this two side, you have a background independent part, so it corresponds to all this moduli space, local coordinates, and this BV structure. And then we have we have say the physics, which is amplitudes, vertices, and the quantum BV action. And and so you can see the CFT as giving you a map from one structure to the other. So the, the CFT will give you a map from the moduli space to the amplitude from the ver set of vertices to the action and from the geometric BV to the quantum BV. So, so CFT is just in some sense, some, um, some uh, in the last case, a BV morphism. So it just takes you one BV structure to another one. And, and this, I think it's something which is amazing in string theory. It's kind of also hinting at background independence to go back because like, this mathematical structure or always exists. You need to define a background to remap to the action and and compute everything, but but you know that you have this background independent structure. You know that you have this geometric BV. So it tells you that you always have the quantum BV and so on. And so, so it's kind of another like more indirect way to prove background independence because this works whichever background you take. And at the end, when you write the string field action, you don't need to re specify the background, say you have Minkos there. So you just need to say, okay, I have a CFT, but you don't care about the CFT itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it's why what's important is way to build all this background independent uh, data, because if you have it, you, you just can work with any CFT, any background, and any application you want in principle. And the nice thing is that because this is a like uh, background independent, so you don't really need the, the physics to, to solve this problem, it's just math. So you need to solve some geometrical problem. And it's what we did with machine learning. I see. So uh, as you said before, that uh, you use uh, these data to train the, you know, the. Uh, I, I don't know if you're using a neural network for this. Are you using a neural network for this? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you well, use some data two, to. Two of them, yeah. Okay. So you use some data to travel, uh, sorry, uh, to train the neural networks. So what, what I want to ask is that, was there enough data to train the network? Yes, because you have an infinite number of points, in fact, of okay, data training. So, so in fact, I mean, it's, uh, you know, said like this, it looks uh, weird because you're like, where, where is this data coming from and so on? Um, and in fact, it was really like a, a, a difficult question when I started to work on it because I, I knew we could use machine learning to solve some problem, but I was not sure how because, you know, most of machine learning and if you run machine learning in textbooks, tutorials, like online lectures, whatever you want. It's always supervised learning. So you always need to, to know like input and output. And so first here, you, the way you need to do it is first uh, given like some moduli, you need to be able to find the local coordinates. Uh, let's start with local coordinates because local coordinates, you need them for, I mean, if you have them for the full space, it's great. Uh, then you can write a restrict to the subspace. So, so you want to, given moduli, get the local coordinates, okay. So it means that you need, uh, if you don't want to supervise, you need to know this map for sufficiently many moduli, moduli points to do it. The problem is that we just know it analytically uh, for two points. Uh, for the, and here I'm just thinking about the four points here. Yeah, if you move to higher, I don't think it's not known now, but on the moduli space, you have some very symmetric points um, so why it's easy to do the computation, but if you move away from this very symmetric point, uh, you cannot do it. Uh, so in our paper with Atakan, we managed also to find, uh, I mean, Atakan managed to find the, also an analytic solution of the real line of the model space. Um, so it's many more points, but because you see like the real line is very special, you cannot expect to find, to use this for training away from the real line. So again, it's, it's not good for training. So the question is how you 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 do this problem and um, and so when I brought so I, I brought a Marie Curie project to work on this but when I wrote it I was you know not sure how to solve the problem and uh, so I just said okay we need some kind of bootstrap so it's something that people do in uh, machine learning in the private sector when they want to 
to do something, but they don't have the data. If the data is not available, that they need to find a way to, you know, start to label the data and then correct by iterative process. So I was imagining something like this. Um, at the end, it's not how it works. So the point is that, so what we understood uh, in this paper, and in fact, it's something very similar, which people use for uh, building biometric, is that in math and in physics, you don't really need supervised learning. Because like, you know, supervised learning is kind of useless, in fact, I would say, uh, because if you have sufficiently many data to train your algorithm, uh, I mean, it means you have already done the classification or you already have some very efficient algorithm. So you don't need to train a neural network for that. Uh, one example is this like prediction of large numbers uh, I worked on uh, with neural networks. Like, what did we learn with it? Like, I, I would say nothing, you know, like we managed to get a precise computation. But, but we cannot use it for anything new because uh, the data set was already there, it's already classified. Um, so, so it's kind of the big limitation of supervised learning is that, yeah, if you have enough data, you don't really need machine learning, I would say. Except if like to get this data, it's very expensive to, to compute. So here it might be interesting to, you know, find something to bypass. But I would say for a problem which has not been solved yet, I don't expect supervised learning to help uh, just because you will not have data. Then the solution is uh, so, some form of unsupervised learning, which in fact is also a generalization of uh, optimization. So, so you know, like you have many problems in physics and math where the idea that you want to build some function which satisfies some constraints. So you have a function f of x, and you have some c of f equals zero, or should be larger than, but let's say equals zero to simplify. And this type of problem uh, are extremely easy to solve uh, with machine learning. And uh, I mean, not say easy, but it's it's a, a nice problem to solve. Uh, so before machine learning, what people would do, so you have this uh, f of x you want to solve, so we just fix x, and then you will try to minimize the constraint c uh, of f of x equals zero. So we just do like uh, optimization, like convex optimization or something like this to try to minimize this constraint, and then you will find the value of f, okay? Um, one, one, um, so then you will move to another point, so x2, and you do it again. Then you move to x3, and you do it again. So you do this convex, of, I mean, any optimization process. Um, when you have found like your f of x1, x2, and so on, you will do some fits to try to get an interpolation of uh, your function f, OK? Now where machine learning helps is to solve this kind of problem, because instead of doing this by step, so first you solve point by point, and then you do a fit, you try to solve for the full function itself. So the mm -hmm. way you do this is that you, 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 you want to represent your function by some structure. So it can be a neural network. It can be like other things. In fact, it could be like a polynomial if you want to do a polynomial fit or so on. The main advantage of neural networks is that they are extremely flexible because you have this universal approximation theorem, which tells you that neural network can approximate any function. I mean, under some mild conditions. Uh, so it's kind of telling you that in general, it's, it's it can find function in a, and be more accurate than standard fit uh, or the interpolation method. So your neural network will depend on some parameters. And now the optimization, what it will do, it will tune all the parameters of the neural network to give you an approximation of the full function. So it will not you know, do it point by point and later you try to get the function. It will try to find the function completely uh, by itself. And it's what we like helped us to solve this problem because, um, okay, so I'm making a small presentation. So to, to solve this problem for the minimal area vertices, you don't need to find the local coordinates themselves immediately. You just need to find a set of complex parameters, which are similar to what are called the accessory parameters in the problem of uniformizing uh, uh, Riemann surface. And you have as many accessory parameters as moduli parameter. So you just need, uh, you know, if you have uh, n, n minus three moduli, you have n minus three accessory parameter. So you just need to find this. And so in a very like uh, set of heroic paper, um, 
Nucleus member uh, managed to solve this for n equal four and n equal five uh, vertices. And he did what I said first. He, like, he was solving like point by point, and then he, he provided some fit. For the four point uh, interaction, the fit is quite small and uh, it's uh, still available. For the five point, he said that the fit was too big. I mean, so the data was really big, so it's not available anywhere. And the fit itself, was not working well, so it could not provide any fit. You had to start directly with the original data, in fact. And uh, and so I, now I don't, I'm not sure that this data is still available anywhere. Uh, so in fact, this effort is kind of lost because you know no one has the data anymore, I think. Um, so instead so, of having this kind of, yes. No, no, I, I think people. So, so instead of you know doing this like this, uh, the machine learning approach would be to say, okay, I don't want to solve this point, and so on. I want my function. And here you have many advantages. So first, uh, because you solve for the function, you can encode things like symmetries. Uh, for example, in his paper, he implemented the symmetries himself. So by just looking at some corner of the module space. But for example, in our case, the neural network did learn the symmetries alone. And in fact, you have even some techniques in the neural network which are able to implement exactly the symmetry and it can help training. So for example, permutation symmetry and so on. Um, so, okay, so, so in this end, it's a bit more general. Um, also, you have access to the function. So for example, if you did, so, okay, it will be an approximation varied in some domain where you did the training. Uh, what you find is that neural networks can extrapolate a bit often. Um, so this is quite nice. Uh, it inter interpolates very well also, so you can, you're almost pretty sure that in the training region, any points you take uh, will be reliable. Um, it's fast. And also, like in machine learning, now most of the uh, code is written as a, with automatic differentiation, which means that your neural network is a real function for, for which you can take derivatives. And, and this is really interesting because now when you start to compute other properties for your Riemann surface or anything, you can just take the derivative of your function, you can integrate it. So you can just work as, as if it's a function, you know, you, you don't have to go back to the individual points, like you just forget the points you use for training because you have a function. Um, it's also very easy to share because you can, to share it, you can just say what is the arch architecture of the neural network. You save the weights, uh, so the parameter of the network in some file, which doesn't take so much space, and you can just send everything to your friend. You don't need to send like all the data points. Um, mm -hmm. So so it's very economical, um, and um, and I think so. Okay, this it's uh, intuition, but I don't have any proof that it works also well if uh, you you don't have a convex optimization case. So I think the network can still work well in these kind of things. So in our case, like. Uh, the solution is unique for the prime we want to solve. Um, so, okay, let me go back to this. So, um, so, so for the minimal area vertex, we want to find the accessory parameters. And we know that they satisfy some constraints, so it's the imaginary part of some integral equals zero. And you see that this is something difficult to solve with optimization because you need, you need to be careful how you define the integral and so on. Um, I mean, it, it can be done, but when you have machine learning, you, you, at the end, you just have some big expression. You can also take derivative of this constraint, for example. So you take derivative, you look at the gradient, and you just minimize this with gradient descent. Right. And, and the good point, so the way you train this, then because you ask about the data, is that, mm -hmm. so the, the loss function just depends on, on the output of your neural network and on the initial points of the moduli. You don't need to know the real value or anything. You just want to get this as close as possible to zero. And so the training data is just random points in the training region. So for example, uh, uh, for, for the four, uh, four point uh, vertex, uh, we took the points in a radius of like two around the region in the complex plane. And, and this you can just take any, as many points as you want. So this function that you were talking about before that uh, when you train the network a uh, neural network enough uh, you know you you can treat the output as a function and then you don't have to send all the data points to your 
collaborator. But after this particular thing, do you discard all the points or do you keep them? I, I discard everything, yes. Oh, but if you keep them, you can train some other neural network on that, don't you think? Yeah, but uh, yeah, but the point is that because it's so cheap to generate random points, you okay. just do ra new random points. So in fact, it's something. So so we did two neural networks for, to solve the problem because first we wanted to get the accessory parameters. From the accessory parameters, you can go back to the local coordinates. So that's so. But we still need to find the subspace of the moduli space which corresponds to the vertex region. So this can be de determined once you know the accessory parameters and the local coordinates. So in principle, you can just do it, you know, run your algorithm and it will give you an answer. The problem is that this is a, a, a bit long to run and it's not very insightful to just say, okay, I have one point. Tell me what is, uh, what is this? Um, mm -hmm. So what we did was to, to take many points compute if they are inside or outside uh, the vertex region. And then we train the neural network. And this time, we use supervised learning because we know the answer. And mm -hmm. here's a good point. Like this uh, supervised net, uh, so this network run, uh, run a classification task. And in that case, it gives you a probability for the points to be inside the vertex region. Now, when you have a probability measure like this, it's great because you can use it uh, as a, a measure in uh, inte integration. So you can we really put this in your, so if you want to compute an interference on, on the vertex region, you don't, you, you can just do the integral over the moduli space and multiply this by the probability distribution you found before, for example. If you want to do Monte Carlo uh, in integration, you can also use that. So it's also more flexible. And something we found very nice is that you, if you look at the probability, so it's what, um, so in lattice simulation, people call the um, uh, confusion. So it's when the network is not very sure about the answer. So the probability will be around 0 0.5. So for example, if you do lattice simulation, it can tell you where is a phase transition because it's where the uh, network will hesitate between the two phases. In our case, the confusion is when the network is not sure if a point is inside or outside the vertex region. And what we found is that basically the, the probability goes like this. So for many points, it's like zero. So we know it's outside. And then there is a very thin boundary where the probability will be between, say, like 1% and 90%. And then it will be again one. And so the point that you can define the boundary of your space by just looking at the place where the probability distribution is not zero or one. And, and so the transition is extremely sharp, so we, we, which tells you also that learning happened very well. Um, but let's say we could say like where it's on 0 0.5, it would work also, but here it's, it's just very sharp. And um, yeah, I forgot your original question why I was doing. Well, the question was that, was there enough data to okay. train the network? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so for example, to train this second network, we just generate new samples. We redo all the computation. And because like generating samples, you know, it takes like half a second or even less. So it's, uh, you, you can get 100,000 points like this. It's, uh, it's very easy. So I think it's the number of points we use uh, 100,000 in general. And something interesting, yes. in fact, is that the, so by using these things and so the full pipeline um, from just really generating the first points to computing the coefficient in the tachyon potential, it takes like four hours. Mm -hmm. um, but for, but here it's using a lot of points and here like the, for example, the accessory parameter where the precision, which is a uh, 10 to the like, five significant digits on the real and imaginary part. So, so it's really precise. Um, now, if you take just 1,000 points to do the training, which, you know, 1,000 points is a, a radius of two, it's not that many. We still get, uh, I think, uh, one or uh, two or three significant digits. And then it runs in 10 okay. minutes. So, so we get really a huge increase in speed compared to the previous optimization method. And data is not around because you can just generate as many as you want. I see. Okay, so uh, you know, uh, let let's go back to the previous question that we were talking about. So uh, we we came to this question of machine learning because you were trying to uh, 
you know learn about the vertices of the closed string uh, string field theory so someone who is not familiar with string field theory but does know about quantum field theory may say that in quantum field theory we have these renormalization constraints on different you know in interactions for example we do know that if you are in four dimensions if you and if you're talking about a scalar field theory you cannot have something like phi to the power of 5 because that's simply not renormalizable do you have a you know any analogs of these kind of constraints in string field theory um so, so yeah we have something a bit similar so it's not with form renormalization because as you know like we have gravity and we have we're mm -hmm. working with effective action and on locality and so on so so we can we cannot like use this kind of argument uh something yeah. we have is uh as i mentioned from the ghost dilaton theorem i mean the fact that you have this ghost dilaton and the uh, so the, the fact that it's a very special field, it also tell, give you some constraint about its potential. So uh, if I remember is that if you look at the effective potential for the Gauss dilaton, so, and you remove all the other fields, you should find zero. Um, so this is one constraint you can implement. And so in fact, we can, so, so let me also tell you a bit the, the vision of where we want to go with this program. So, so for point, Okay, it was already known from Muller, so we did not really bring anything new except, like, I think, the, so the method. Uh, then we would like to move to five points. So this was known, but as I said, I think the data, original data is lost. So when we do it, we still provide so, a new way to compute for the community. And then we hope to move a few more orders, so like six, seven, eight, let's see. What we want to do there is to compute so to try to find the vacuum of the clustering tachyon so to try to assess if there is a vacuum or not um, in a kind of definite way so we hope that uh, with a few more orders and doing a very truncation at various orders we'd be able to understand a bit better how this vacuum behave now indeed like when we move to higher and higher orders we move in a territory where it's a bit like uncharted so we need a way to test uh, if like if the vertices were obtained or correct. So we have several ways to do it. So first, as I said, like the accessory parameters uh, or a solution. Uh, so there is a mathematical theorem telling you that the solution is unique. So we know that if we minimize this to a very low uh, precision, uh, so we get almost zero, we know that we found the good accessory parameter. But then there is all the things done the pipe. And one thing we want to use is indeed this constraint um, from the gauss dilaton theorem to try to say, to to make sure that uh, the vertices, after you integrate and everything, gives you, uh, I mean, they are correct. And in fact, what we found already for uh, the four-point vertex is that not all of them work so good. So something we used was to ch check that they can extrapolate to the the training region. To find this extrapolation, we compared with an analytic solution on the real line. Uh, this is also something we can uh, we expect to be able to generate to high order. So we expect that there will be few lines or subspace where we can get an analytic solution. So we can also match uh, the, the result of the whole network with this analytic solution. Uh, so, so it's the two main check I have in mind, but uh, but indeed it's important because we we found that the neural network if it doesn't extrapolate well. It doesn't give you so good results. So what we do in our pipeline is to train few networks um, and then discard the one which don't extrapolate and we do the statistic just over this one. I see. And one more question that I want to ask is that, uh, can you briefly talk about this um, correspondence that I'm kind of intrigued by? So there is this correspondence between neural networks and quantum field theories, uh, which is called NNQFT correspondence. And what I was kind of in uh, you know blown away by learn uh, uh, by is by learning that you can talk about RG flows or renormalization group flows of neural networks. So do you think that this particular correspondence can help us solve some problems that we were not able to solve before? And first of all, can you briefly talk about what is this correspondence? Yeah. So, um, okay. So the idea that if you take neural networks. Uh, you kind of, so what is a neural network? So, so it's basically some, some structure where, where you have many parameters. Uh, at initialization, these parameters are taken. 
to be random. And, and they will define some function. And so the function you can get with a given architectures or all the function you, you would get if you change the samples of your parameter distribution. Okay, so what you can see is that the given one architectures and parameter distribution, you will get a distribution in function space. Um, so it's the first observation. Now, what, what, how do you characterize this probability distribution in the function space? So there is a, a kind of theorem which tells you that at, if you take the uh, size of the internal layers, so the width, to be infin infinite, in fact, you will get a Gaussian. Why is it so? In some way, it's because, uh, uh, like, if you take the simplest neural network, so the fully connected, they will work by matrix multiplication, for some non linearity but basically, you will get matrix multiplication times a vector. So you have your initial vector, you do a matrix multiplication. Then you will do again a matrix multiplication on the resulting vector, vector and so on, until you get some vector. So now you see that if the width is very large, the matrix are very large. So the vectors you get after will be also large. Okay. So in all the sum, you will get an infinite number of, uh, so a sum of infinitely many numbers. And by the uh, central uh, theorem, it tells you that it should be Gaussian, uh, that the result should be a Gaussian. So it's kind of one motivation to know that, okay. Uh, lab, at large width, so large n, uh, it's a Gaussian. So now, if you take a function space and you have a Gaussian uh, distribution, what does it look like? So it will be integral of df, exponential of f, kf, where k is some kernel. Um, and this, in fact, it, it just looks like a QFT. Because if you look at the path integral of a QFT, it's just the same, like it's uh, integral over the functions, and then you have your quadratic term. So it's a free QFT. And it's how this like, thing started, is that by saying, okay, large n neural network of free QFT. Now, if you are not at large n, you will get correction to the Gaussian. So what is correction to a free QFT? It's interaction. So you need to just add some uh, some interaction to 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 characterize your probability distribution. And mm. okay, at this stage, it's nothing more than what people do in math. For example, they will just characterize probability distribution and function space and so on. The additional things which come from doing more like the QFT mindset that you can use tools from QFT, like Feynman diagrams to, to make the computation in uh, more easier and try to see if you can use renormalization or some other principle uh, to help you. Now, one thing important is that uh, when you work with this NNQFT, the QFT you get are we really like general probability distribution. So we should not make any assumption like what we do in, in uh, particle physics. So there is no like point about locality, uh, you know, point carré symmetry, like causality. In principle, like by, by default, you should just get rid of every assumption, which I think it's something not everyone will appreciate about this NNQFT that we, we come with all you know, as a luggage from the theoretical physicist. Um, but there are many things which should go away. And I think that's something which helped me to see that you have many more ways to write QFT is because I worked on uh, tensor models, which are also relaxing many assumptions about QFT and string theory, where you also relax uh, things. So, so in NNQFT, you can get with also more general QFT. And it's something I like to see like which type of general QFT you can work with, not necessarily just local particle physics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so you have this uh, QFT, and so now when you have a neural network, you can in some sense decide if you want to set, to define it by sampling the distribution of the parameters, the distribution in function space. So you have this duality between the two. Right. And uh, okay. And so one way to to start to work with this, that so there are some principles to define the the Gaussian part, so the quadratic part. And to fix the uh, interaction, the way you can do it is just a bit like we do in particle physics, you do experiments. So here's the experiment is that you take your neural network, you give some inputs, you give some outputs, you compute correlations, and then you fix the interaction you need to reproduce this. And now, so your neural network will depend on various 
what we call hyperparameters. So hyperparameters are everything which are not the with a like internal parameters. So for example, one hyperparameter is the width of the neural network. Uh, other hyperparameters uh, like mean, standard deviation, and other properties of the distribution you are using for the hyper for the parameters. Uh, it can be also the type of activation function you have, so the nonlinearities. So any parameter which defines the architectures is an hyperparameter. So now in the QFT, all these parameters will appear. So the n will appear, and what is nice is that this n appears as a one over n expansion. So in fact, you know that you have a QFT with a very nice uh, perturbative expansion. Um, and other parameter can, parameters can be there. So one question is that, is there a way, uh, if I know the action for one set of hyperparameters, can I get the action for other hyperparameters? And this is very interesting for right. like applications because hyperparameter tuning is extremely expensive. So, you know, for models like GPT and so on, finding the good set of hyperparameters can take one year and cost like dozens of millions of dollars. So if you have a way to like pinpoint to hyperparameter in an easier way, it's something people would love to see in the you know industry. Uh, mm -hmm. This was my original motivation to try to like shorten this time to find hyperparameter with this because in Panda, if you if you find your action with hyperparameter, I mean one set of par hyperparameter, and you have a principle to give you the action for other hyperparameters, then you can use QFT to compute correlations, and you can try to fix the value of the hyperparameters according to some principle like a one point value of one point function, one point function, this kind of thing. Uh, so this was the dream. Uh, in practice, I, I'm a bit skeptical we can really go somewhere with that because the, the main drawback is that, you know, if you do hyperparameter tuning, you need to run your neural network many times by ch and change the hyperparameters each time, okay? Here in our case, even if you had a physics principle to tell you, okay, uh, we know, uh, I mean, give me the action with one value of each parameter and I give you the action with all the other values. Uh, even if we know this, it would be difficult because to fix the original uh, parameters, you need to do this experiment, as I said. But to find the experiments, you need to run your, to do the average of the your neural network over many inputs, but also many parameters. Because what you want to find is what happens on average for the distribution you are looking at. Uh, and because of this, it would cost, uh, I mean, you would still need to run your network many times. Uh, so, so, you know, like the trade-off of like running with different values of hyperparameter would be changed to running the network with many initialization. So, so there is kind of, I mean, you are still, you still have to run it many times. So, so the only way I would see out is to refine the complete theory of an NQFT from scratch where you just you know, you would be you like given the architecture, you would be able to characterize everything and do all the computation without having to do any numerics or just very few. Then it could work, but uh, so it's a bit complicated. I see. So w one thing that we always have in uh, always have in uh, you know renormalization group flows uh, is the cutoff, right? And we do know that as we change the cutoff, the character of the theory changes. So in uh, in the case of neural networks, there is this built-in cutoff in the precision of the machine, right? But the question that I want to ask is that what does u uh, what does the UV limit mean in this particular case? Or does it mean that there is some hyper precise machine there, or you know, or perfect machine there? Or does it mean that, or do you think yeah, that, it's what that would doesn't make sense? Mm. Uh, uh, it's what I would expect. Like, then, does it make sense or not? Or this I'm not sure. So in our paper, in fact, we explored the two different cutoffs of the machine precision indeed, but we didn't really manage to make contact with the numerical experiments. Um, so the precise role of this and connection to like, numerics is not so clear. Um, but in fact, there is a second cutoff, which, so okay, in our case, we looked at just one architecture, but I, I think it might generalize to anything, to, you know, any architecture, is that you have this standard deviation of the, initial parameters. And this also appear like a, a renormalization uh, scale. 
And because the way like, so in, in the model we looked, this appears as an exponential of some like uh, k square. So if you work in momentum space, uh, divided by this sigma w square. So this sigma w is like a very large mass uh, cutting the fluctuation for large k. Um, and, and the way it appears, and if you look at general formulas of, uh, for this like large neural network, it, it kind of looks like you, you will always get these kind of factors. Um, so again, I didn't check it carefully now, but it, it looks it would be there. So it would be one way to define the RG flow for any architectures to, to move this sigma W. Um, and something which is interesting that this sigma W is also like behave in the same way as uh, what is called the stub parameter in string field theory. Um, so in fact, the RG equation we got for this sigma W, so this standard deviation of uh, initial weights, uh, is the same equation people got in the context of string field theory for the stub parameter. And in fact, uh, in our case, so, so the architecture we look gives you like the simplest effective action because it's almost correct for this exponential of k square in a kinetics term. Uh, it, it, it's very similar to what is called periodic string theory, uh, so which are model having almost the same form. So, so there is some connection between and then QFT and string, string theory or string field theory, uh, in the sense that uh, if you truncate string field theory, you would get things quite similar to, I mean. So in some oh. limit, I would say that like both be a very similar. So, so I think it's also why it's nice to have some ideas from string field theory for an NQFT because it will help to understand a bit better this, mm -hmm. this QFT. I see. Okay. So, you, you did one of your post talks from uh, India in uh, you know Harish Chandra Institute with Ashok Sen. So how was that experience of working with Ashok Sen? Um, so so it was I mean it was very interesting. So first I think it, it would be interesting to say how I came maybe to string theory theory because it's why I really wanted to go to to India first. Um, so so in fact I continue the middle of the last year of master I was still hesitating between. So which direction to go? So I did my internship on tensor models with people in more like group quantum clarity community. And overall, I'm quite open-minded with the different approaches. And I think it's important that a bit of, like, you know, different people work on different things, such that we have more tools and ideas and techniques. Um, and then I came to, so I had some introduction to string theory uh, in uh, lectures, both in Perimeter Institute and in France. And, and then I decided that like things were speaking better to me, like I had some better things with it. Uh, so I decided to go for it. And, uh, but I still wanted to go to more like fundamental aspect of string theory first. So, so I discovered string field theory at the end of my master. And, and I knew it's what I wanted to do because, you know, it's kind of like the most fundamental, it's QFT, which is great. Um, and, and you can really tackle like important questions like background independence and so on. Like, um, so then I started to look around in Paris uh, to do my PhD on that, and then everyone told me like, uh, "Don't do that. Uh, it's completely stupid. Uh, you should you know, do string field theory. It's useless, uh, and so on." Um, and, and like a funny thing, for example, is also is that during in the string theory class, the exam, so the teacher proposed a list of topics we could decide. So it was an oral exam, so we have the topic in advance, we prepare, and then we present. But we could also choose our own topic if you want it so and ask if it's fine. So I asked to present something on string field theory and I got a no, <laughs> no way, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> um, so, you know, it was a bit disappointing and so on. So then I went to do my PhD on uh, supergravity and uh, ATS CFT and black holes. And I was like, okay, you know, I knew that I would just go back later. I was like, supergravity is great because it's like effective actions for string theory. So it's still, you know, something useful, but so I, I put a break on string field theory also because, as we mentioned before, like there are so few, I mean, back in the time, there are no reviews, no books, like nothing on string field theory, except on the open bosonic string uh, from Witten. But I would say like this theory is a bit too specific and too simple to, to really learn about the general string field theory. So, so it was not easy to start, you know, by yourself. So I was like, okay, I will do this later. Um, and when I, uh, so at the end of my PhD, I didn't find uh, any postdoc position. 
And there are this, uh, so there are the grants be shared between people in Paris and in India. And uh, so I was proposed to go in India and I was like, okay, great. Now I can just infecture it. Um, so, so it's really like why I was extremely motivated. Uh, it got complicated because like the agency in charge of the grants uh, forgot to do my visa. And so because of this, uh, I could stay at most for six months uh, in India and also I was not paid. Uh, so I still decided to go because I really wanted to, to work with Ashoxan and to spring factory. Um, so I went and okay, we got some uh, arrangements where I could still get accommodation and some per diems there, but you know, it was like not easy to go and uh, also for, for some good side friends. Um, so, okay, so, so I arrived in India and then by chance, uh, it was, you know, just this time where Ashokzen was starting to, like, started to work again on String Factory. I mean, it was, uh, it started uh, at the end of 2014. So you had this paper on mass normalization, uh, vacuum shift. And uh, right before I arrived, there was this paper on the understanding the BV uh, action for super string. Um, so basically, it was just, you know, the, the best time to go uh, because it was, Momentum was picking up again. Um, and also, like Ashok did uh, some lectures on super string factory. And he presented the super string factory in a way you don't, you don't find anywhere. So with this perspective, saying a bit more like, I mean, first going through all the structure, remain surface and so on, uh, which you can find explains this quite just in the old paper from Barton Scribar from uh, 93. But then he explained also a lot this per perspective of saying, okay, look, uh, we don't, like forget about the remand surface, like all this complicated thing of string filtering. Just think about it as a QFT of many local fields. And then it really, I mean, I, I think like to me, it was kind of a revelation to, to start string filtering this way because it just, you know, like decreases the entry barrier a lot. Like, because you, you can just go back to your intuition of normal Feynman diagrams, like normal everything. And uh, so th this week, right? and um, so, so then in part of the lectures, I asked uh, Ashok if he had some idea of a project I could uh, look at. So he it, it suggested to investigate uh, crossing symmetry uh, because at that time he was working on trying to establish the consistency of string, of string theory using string field theory. And here it's something again, you cannot do in string theory, like proving the theory is finite. And, both infrared and UV, you cannot do it with worksheet method. Even the UV finiteness is kind of shaky because you will get divergence in the scattering amplitudes. So if you want to re argue for UV finiteness, you need string filter. Uh, in the same way, like cut cost rule, unitarity, you cannot redo really it at all group orders in string theory. So, so this was kind of the program. And it's something like there are still a few things to do to just show string theory is a fully consistent QFT. And, and we know that crossing symmetry is a kind of an important feature. Uh, so we wanted to check if it's there, but one other motivation for crossing symmetry is that in the original derivation is that, um, so crossing symmetry is a consequence of locality. So now you can imagine that if string theory is crossing symmetric, especially at all group orders, it's kind of telling you that it should not be too bad in terms of locality because, you know, you, you would expect otherwise to see some violation. Um, so so, it's, so I, th I thought it was a, a great project, um, but then it was kind of difficult to start with because so, so it's like, uh, you, you know, it was hard to, to see how to start. Like there was very literature really on this problem. Uh, very few people try to work on proving crossing symmetry, like in most books, I mean, you know, any paper in general, people use crossing symmetry, but if you want to prove it, or even to do a, like an explicit example, for example, at one group, uh, it, it's not easy. And in fact, all the literature like where people were really trying to do computation with this, and I mean, here it was mathematical proof, it's from 65. So, you know, you have to go back and understand this style. So, so, so it was hard like, uh, to understand how to make progress and so on. And, and, um, so yeah, we uh, we got stuck out. And I think here it's maybe one difficulty of working with uh, Ashok sometimes that when he gives you a problem, if it's not clear how to proceed, it, it's, uh, I would say it, it's hard to see how, where we go. 
And uh, so you can always pick with him and he will explain everything. Uh, but but uh, okay, maybe it's also because this topic, you know, like, as I said, no one was working on this. So, um, so, so, like, if you start the string filtering and, uh, and, and there has not so much precise guidance of here is the next step to do, uh, so I was feeling a bit lost. Um, on the other hand, like, uh, every time we, uh, I, I was trying, you know, finding some paper or trying to do something. It was very easy to go to see Ashok and ask questions. And it's something which I, I rarely find from the anywhere else. So I found it again, uh, for example, with Spartan and, and a few other people, but it's just extremely easy to, to ask questions. Like even during the lectures, you know, I mean, you can feel when someone is annoyed when you ask a question and, and you have some people who just ask like smart questions. If it's not smart, they will be like, whatever, I don't care. But this never happened a single time like in Ashok lectures. And, you know, there are like dozens of lectures. Yeah, and uh, and, and then you just explain everything very patiently and, and also it just has a way to, you know, explain physics. I don't know if you have watched some of his lectures, I mean, even the talks, but the lectures is seven. More is that, so so you have this effect that sometimes we call the Ashok effect, that during the lectures, you have the impression to understand everything perfectly. And when you go back one or two weeks later, it's not less, not so clear, but but it's just that on the time where you have this uh, like this explanation, it, it's very clear uh, mm -hmm. because it's just a way to to go down to the most important concept and like removing all the things which are less important to refocus on you know the with the core of the idea, which I think was very helpful. And this was also the case if we you know you go to ask him a question on the project or something, he will. Just explain everything. I say it's no stupid question, which uh, I was really mm -hmm. amazed after all my time in Paris and with French people, you know. Um, so yeah, so so right. for, in terms of project overall, I would say it's uh, it, it, it was great, but still difficult because we were stuck all this time, and um, and also something which is a bit hard sometimes with Ashok is that he's extremely fast to compute and do things. So so if you have a project, you know you. Uh, keeping pace uh, can be difficult. So, so I would say it's uh, it was one of the changing things which uh, I had not seen before. Is that just the speed of going? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, but you you learn a lot. Like it just uh, as I say, like the way he thinks about things and the way he explains, you you feel that it's yeah, you know, it's not, it's not like what you get from most people. Like say, it, it's really different ways of thinking about things. I think. Uh, which I found very enlightening. I think, and, and you just said that uh, you know the problems that you were working on. Uh, I think probably uh, he was the only one, or a very limited number of people were working on those problems, uh, which implies that if you want to, uh, you know, learn some particular kind of calculations, there is not a lot of literature that you can mm -hmm. read, right? So, was that one of the problems that you faced when you were working on these problems? So. Uh, yes, and so in it, so for string theory, it was definitely a problem. But for the the problem we are looking at, so crossing symmetry, in fact, we are mostly attacking it from a QFT side. Uh, so here, it's sometimes seems even harder because you know in string theory, you 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 still have a community. Like this, on the other hand, people who trying to understand the uh, like this S matrix program, so establishing crossing symmetry and so on, like no one. Is, is doing this anymore. I mean, some people started to do it again from some other perspective, but all this school of people from the 60s trying to establish like QFT in a rigorous way, um, basically it's not the case anymore. I mean, there was no more like, people like this and not really like recent lecturers. So you, so in general, and also most of these people were closer to mathematicians and physicists. Um, so you had a few books explaining like this crossing symmetry and so on, like from Bogol, Yubov, uh, and other people, mm -hmm. but in a, in a very formal way, and I'm not so good with very formal, like math. Right. Uh, so, so this was hard indeed, because, uh, you know, there, there are no one way to talk with. Yeah. I mean, if, if there are some people even today who are trying to formulate QRT in a, in a very rigorous way, but it's hard to read their work. For example, I'm sure you know about, um, there was this guy in Canada named Kevin Costello. Mm. He works on these kind of things, but it, it's hard to follow, you know, the work that yeah. they're doing because mm. it's very formal. Yeah. Okay, so 
I think the last um, part of the questions that I have is about the book that you wrote on string field theory. And the thing is that I wanted to buy that book, but, uh, you know, some friend of mine actually gifted me that book on my birthday. <laughs> so that's good. So the thing is that, okay, so this is a, a very recent book on string field theory. It came in 2021, if I'm not wrong. Uh, one thing that intrigues me is that you wrote this book as a postdoc, which is not usual. So was that difficult to do as a postdoc? Was it hard to find time to do that as a postdoc? Um, so, so finding time was not that hard. I mean, it demands your mm -hmm. perspective. So, so the point that after India I was very lucky to get a Humboldt fellowship to go to Munich, and the original project was on uh, cosmology and supergravity. Uh, but then, uh, because I wanted to do string field theory, I just completely shifted. Uh, so because first I had started in India. And then in Munich, you have uh, Ivo Sachs, uh, who, who was doing string field theory. And uh, also, like, uh, my uh, supervisor there, Michael Hack, uh, is also in, was also interested in string field theory, so it was just natural to shift to string field theory. And, and here, I have to say that I'm very grateful to Humboldt because, you know, you do a project, you they accept it or not. But if they accept, then in fact, you are very, completely free to move to some other things if you feel it's good to do it. So, so like there was no point, like uh, the question of whether I, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I knew I could just start to work on string theory even if I, it was not the project. Um, so, um, so I wanted to do that, but then at that stage, I was still like, you know, new in the field. So like still trying to learn. And, uh, and then when I arrived, Ivo Sachs told me that, uh, I mean, proposed me to teach string theory if I wanted uh, in the master of uh, LMU. And uh, so first I was hesitating because, as I said, I was very new in the field. I had started less than one year ago. Um, and also it was difficult because there were no reviews or book. Uh, then on the other hand, I thought, okay, it would be a very good way to, to just relearn it by going through all the review, I mean, all the papers and we're trying to write things. Um, so, so I took it really as a, like, you know, six months off to, to just run string theory properly and, uh, in all the details. So in terms of time, I would say so to answer to your question, it was not difficult because I could decide of my time quite freely. I mean, my uh, supervisor was very understanding and also interested in that class, so, so it was easy. On the other hand, I didn't work on any project during that time. And, uh, and in fact, I was basically teaching uh, three, two times a week. No, three times a week. Okay, I forgot, maybe two times. And basically, I was spending all the rest of my time writing the book. So at that time, I didn't know it would be a book. It was just like lecture notes because no lecture notes were available anywhere. So I was just working on them uh, all the time. And I would say it was good that I had this, uh, this lectures to give because I knew that I just had, let's say, one week to write each chapter because I had to teach it after. If I had started to write uh, notes otherwise, it would have taken much longer, and I think I would maybe still not be finished because, you know, you, you don't have the deadline. But here, I really had to write a lot each week. Um, so it was very intense. So during those four months, I was just doing this all the time, uh, basically. Uh, but but then I, it really helped me to to understand string theory, I think, and. Uh, and also establish my own conventions and, you know, have a place where I can always like, go back. Um, and in fact, like some professors in Munich saw the lectures and, and told me like, uh, uh, they, they knew people at Springer, so it's how they put me in touch to publish it because indeed like, there are no books on the topic. And uh, I was really trying to be pedagogical to, to bring some resources to, to people to just like be able mm -hmm. to start string theory. Uh, and I, I think I, didn't completely achieve this. So, so I think I achieved the, uh, so I explained how to use, to compute in CFT for string theory, and I also explained how to think in terms of Riemann surface. Uh, but if you see the book, there are not so many applications. And uh, I think what would be useful, in fact, is we really like to do so one like this, where you just construct string theory from scratch and you go with, you know, like each step you go and you're very consistent and you just derive everything. And you will need another book. And here it's an idea which was suggested by a uh, key Kim, uh, now in Stanford, who told me that you need a book like Peskin Schroeder, where you don't display the full theory, 
you just explain how to compute things. Um, and, and this, I think, like in my book, I don't have many applications, so it's not a book you you we I think be able to use to to redo research and things. But you still get the general picture. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so so it's how it started like from this lecture notes in Munich. Um, and I I think yeah, it was really great to have all this flexibility uh, offered by Humboldt and my advisor. So in this book, you focus on closed string field theory and you don't talk a lot about open string field theory. Uh, in some future editions, do you want to include some material on open string field theory? Yes, yeah, definitely. So my, my goal, so, so I have a very big list of things I want to add. Um, so mm -hmm. I think I have uh, maybe for five or six editions now. <laughs> but um, yeah, sure. so, no, I'm, I'm joking, but, I, I don't, but definitely I want to add more contents. I think my first... Um, so, so I started to work a bit on second edition and to add a few more things. So in particular, I want to clarify a bit more like uh, all the things like on conjugations and how to compute effective action uh, and also scattering amplitude. So, so it's like the big work for the next uh, edition. Um, and also clarify a bit the geometric BV, where it comes from. Uh, so, so it's the uh, main things. And in it, like for the after that, uh, I, I would like to add more open string. I see. The main so, reason for I not think... including open string is that you know there are many reviews on analytic solutions and open string in general, and mm -hmm. especially recently, like Pedro wrote an excellent review. Um, so I felt like it was less necessary to explain those things. Uh, because it's I mean you you have already a lot of content and uh, material. Uh, but still, I think it would be good to have everything in one place. So, so it's why I'm, I'm planning to do it at some point. So do you think that uh, if you add a lot of stuff, it may happen that this book becomes uh, a two-volume book? Yeah, maybe. I, I will see what the editor says. But uh, like, you know, I don't like when it's all volumes because you need to carry the different volume. So I would prefer like, you know, a very big okay, book sure. uh, you can use as, as a pivot. But... Uh, um, sure. But yeah, like uh, yeah, it might, it might grow. So one limitation is that already for the first edition, I was above the page limit for the collection. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I get more content, I don't know what will happen. So so okay, I, I didn't ask the editor yet what I mean how to go next. I just know I want to write the thing, so I will do it. And um, also the editor was very kind in accepting that I can upload the draft online. So there's always like mm -hmm. the draft of the first edition. And the draft of the ongoing uh, like materials I'm, I, I am adding. So worst case scenario, it will just be online. Best case, indeed, it will go to maybe some other collection. I don't know. So this, uh, I, I, I don't know. So I, I'm sure you will agree with me on this one, uh, that you know one thing that will make this book much more valuable to students is that if it has more exercises. So do you want to add exercises to this book? Yeah, so... I don't know. It, it, like in the, uh, when I was doing my lecture notes, I tried to add a few exercises. And uh, and then I removed them because I found that at the end, I had like five exercises in the full book. <laughs> so not very useful. Um, it's better than nothing. Yeah, it's but I mean, still right? it was like three or exercises, like, you know, check Vera Soro algebra, which you can find in thousand books already. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So I don't, I, I'm not such a big fan of exercise overall, because me, for example, I know I'm never doing the exercise uh, in books because just, you know, I, I know I should, but like, I just like reading. Um, but, but I understand that it's, it's of some value. So, uh, and also apparently is that when I was teaching, the, I had a teaching assistant, so Christophe, who brought like many tutorials. Uh, they were available online until recently. I, I think they disappeared now, so I should put them back. But so there are some uh, tutorials, and indeed that someone I was thinking maybe to add this as an exercise. But uh, Christophe did them, so like, uh, I think it's better to, to leave them aside. Um, but the tutorials were really interesting, you know, to go more and like do some computations. Uh, but okay, to go back to the book, I think the main motivation for not having exercise is, is I was thinking this book as a reference. And so I want to spell out all the details that people don't have to, you know, I don't want to leave something implicit. It's something I have with exercise is that it's when people say, okay, 
right, this very important concept is the solution to some exercise. Right, this mm -hmm. activity, because if you really want to know this, to understand this quickly, you can. For example, you know, you do some, you work on some paper, you have some project, and you just want to know the solution. If the only place it is, you can find it, it's some in some exercise, then you're stuck. I mean, you need to go through and, I, okay, there is some value to it, but you know, like, I think there, there is so little material on string theory which you can access easily. Uh, I, I was saying this book, I just a place where everything is written, everything is derived, and there is nothing mm -hmm. hidden. Like I, you just give everything to people. Um, right. I think where the exercise would be very valuable is if someone was writing this second book, as I, I was mentioning before, where it's more like hand, you know, hands-on and you just do the computation. Here, I would see it very well with many exercises. Uh, Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it, it was a big question. Actually, I do exercise or not, but I, I decided that for a reference book, I prefer no exercise. Okay, I mean there are good books which have no exercises. For example, I'm sure you know about this book by Blumenhagen and Plaschen on conformal mm -hmm. field theory. They they have no exercises as well. Yeah. Uh, I think their exercise is to derive what they have derived. I think they, yes. that's the exercise, right? Okay, uh, so one, one uh, side so, question. So just a small yeah. uh, remark, in fact, on this. So for my lectures, what I did, so I had a special version for the students. So if you know in my book, like in general, I try to write the text and write the equation, and then the derivation will be aside in some box. So in fact, mm -hmm. in my lectures, the PDF I gave to the students was without this box. So I have a very easy way to compile and remove this. So in some sense, the exercise is indeed to just derive the box without looking at it. Just that you know, I would not like if I had to write it every time, it would be painful. So, so I just thought that right. readers would not look at the derivation immediately, but try to do it. I see. I see. Okay. One side question that I have is that uh, before your book came out, there used to be this book on string field theory on by Warren Siegel. So, have you seen that book? And uh, do you think that that book has some things that you will want to have in your book as well? Uh. So, yeah, I, I think I would say not really, uh, because the first, most of the book is on more like word line. And also it's more like explaining some very like different formulations uh, of things. And if you look string theory is really in fact the, just the last uh, chapter. And, uh, and also I would say, so the notation are very different from what we are used to. Um, and I, I know that it's a common thing in you know the string theory community to say that this book is not so useful to study string theory. And I think the few things which are useful are like free action. And indeed, I don't have this free action in my book, but it's what I'm planning to add in the next edition and something I already did for various like papers. So, so I would add this, but it's not because it's in that book. Like it's just because it's something mm -hmm. which would be there. Um, so yeah, I don't think this book, uh, I mean, I'm sure there are so certainly like interesting things if you want to understand better, like world line and so on. Uh, but for string filter itself, like, I, I, I'm not even sure they have interaction in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it's, it just to all that, like most of the main ideas happened between 90 and 95 and the book appeared before. So, so I don't think it's, it's, uh, very That's adapted it. now. I see. Okay, so I think uh, my questions are kind of over now, but the thing is that uh, when I announced this podcast, some people asked me some questions to ask you. Uh, I think that we don't have a lot of questions from that particular category, but I have some questions. So so the first question says that, would string theory be the end of physics as we know it, or will it open a new frame of theoretical physics, framework of theoretical physics? Um, I, I don't think it would change too much because, I mean, the main motivation is, uh, as we have seen, like QFT, it does a universal language of modern physics. So if you just write string filter in this language, you just like, in fact, take things so even more in modern physics. Um, like wh what would really change is if, so uh, it's quite clear that string filter is not the end, uh, string theory or string filter is not the end because we have many things we cannot really do, like for example, explicit background the dependence. Uh, we just work with fluctuation, but we would like to have an action which has the full action, not just the fluctuation. 
Um, we don't want to work with a second context formulation, but uh, like directly with QFT. So we have this kind of problems. And then we also know that in Canada, we need to go to end theory at some point. And I don't think string field theory will be able to encode this. I mean, it's, it's current form, maybe if we find a background independent formulation. Um, so it's like, on a thing very well, string field theory and string theory, I don't think it will change much. Um, mm -hmm. If we move to M theory, for example, writing a membrane field theory, it will again use, if it use again QFT and so on, it will still be like the general concept, but just like, I mean, tools and techniques, but explaining more things. Um, in, in that scenario, I don't think we, it would fundamentally change. Uh, what I can imagine is indeed that if we cannot use QFT to describe M theory, uh, then we might need to read develop something completely new and some like you know new tools, new understanding. Uh, so, so it's really there that I can see some potential development, but I'm I'm not convinced it will happen. Like maybe you you just need to write a membrane field theory and uh, in some way and so on and do it. So okay. so yeah I don't I don't think I don't see any big change coming from string theory right now. But yeah if we get stuck it might Hints that there is something behind, really. And again, like maybe string theory is just a mathematical theory, uh, and it's not the real theory of quantum gravity. So in that case, like, yeah, mm -hmm. it will not change so much for physics, I would say. Okay. So the next question is that how should one go about learning about complex manifolds and Calabi-Yau manifolds for theoretical physics? Um. Okay, so yeah, it's a good question. So, so in fact, so this I started to learn it uh, uh, during my uh, PhD for when I was doing uh, supergravity because here you have complex scalar and quaternionic manifolds, and I used a lot uh, lecture notes from uh, Stefan van Doren from Utrecht. Uh, I, I know there are some other so, I'll, and I also use the book from. Um, uh, Van Poyen, Antoine Van Poyen, and uh, Friedman, uh, which was also great. So it was a main two source I used to learn uh, the things, but it's more a complex manifold in uh, higher dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to learn, for example, more like Riemann surface and, and this, uh, I basically learned it from string theory book. Uh, so I, I know you have also very good like math books uh, out there and lecture notes, but I didn't go through any of them like really deeply, so I don't have any good recommendation. Uh, I, I think it really depends on which topic, but yeah, because for, for example, you know, for string field theory or string theory, like what you find in Blumenhagen or Nakahara, for example, is completely fine. Yeah, so Nakahara is also a very good source mm -hmm. I used a lot. Um, and uh, I, I would say it should be fine for most of things we need for like physics. What, what would you what would you what would you say about the notes by Philip Candelis on Calabi-Yau manifolds? Uh, I don't know them. So the point that okay. I, I have not done so much Calabi-Yau because uh, it's more for compactifications. Um, uh -huh. So I had Calabi-Yau in my work on machine learning for computing Hodge numbers, but here I approached it with a more like. Uh, machine learning perspective. So I try to not use any mathematical input. So in fact, like, you know, I learned a bit about it. Yeah, maybe I, I read this notes before, but I forgot. So, but I didn't need with the details for the project. So, so I don't know can be very well. Okay. Okay. So the last question is that, do you think that physics students should start learning about machine learning and quantum computing early on in their studies? Yes, definitely. I think so. You know, in fact, now I, my new postdoc is on quantum computing, so <laughs> obviously I have to say that it's interesting. Um, but I really do think it is. Um, so, so I think in, in many, so now physics became and math became very complicated. Um, so it often happens that to solve uh, some problems, you have to to use every, you know, you cannot just do everything by hand, um, especially if you just want the results. And you know, I mean, if you want to do the deep theory, you can try to just do the, the uh, only analytic and no computer. But even in some cases, like people start to with computers to get insights and then they will understand how to 
to do the real proof backend. So, so I would say in all fields now almost you need the help from computer at some point. And computer means that you have many ways to do the computations. So, and, and I don't think there is one way which is necessarily better over the other. For example, I will not say that machine learning is always the best, uh, but it can definitely help. And um, this I remember for a job interview in France, I was saying that uh, I, I wanted to do machine learning for lattice simulation. And someone told me like, oh, uh, why we should do this? Uh, we do Monte Carlo since 30 years. Monte Carlo is the best and we don't need anything else. Uh, machine learning is useless, blah, blah, blah. So if you see someone you know, who became very good with Monte Carlo, he doesn't want to, I mean, he wants to be able to continue to publish paper uh, without like uh, other people doing better and faster. So he says this, but, but I think machine learning is very valuable in that problem because it can solve uh, things which Monte Carlo can't. But on the other hand, like if Monte Carlo works well for some set of parameters, on, why right. use machine learning, you know? And I think for, for everything, it's like this. Like if, if it's good to have different techniques because you can always pick the one which works best and you can just also see the problem with different angles. So for, for example, like uh, going back to this machine learning for string theory, uh, if I had not studied string machine learning before, I would not have thought about attacking the prime this way. Maybe I would just try to do again the optimization for higher orders, uh, which would not be convenient. And and also like it gives you different perspective about what is the, the meaning of object to manipulate. Uh, also because you have to encode them in the computer in different ways. Um, so so I think it's good to have you know different techniques, different ways to look at things, different ways to solve. Um, it's good to, to be able to do it. Uh, I mean, I like to do as much as I can on paper also. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I also like, some, you know, Mathematica and uh, machine learning. So I think it's good to, to have many tools. And the earlier right. one runs, the more efficient one will be later uh, if one needs to go back there. So, so I definitely think machine learning should be there uh, in the curriculum like very early. Quantum computing a bit less uh, because today there is like no really useful quantum computing uh, thing. Uh, we still need to make the quantum computer work and to find like efficient algorithm and so on. So, so what it will be useful, but I, I think now, like now people should run quantum computing only if they want to work on quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Or get like a, other skills to find jobs. In. Academia doesn't succeed or something like this, but right. uh, yeah, you cannot use it to solve any problem, I think. Well, uh, at least you can have uh, courses on quantum information that talk about these protocols like BB84 yes. and B92, right? Uh, okay, so you just said that uh, uh, machine learning should be in the curriculum. So do you think that uh, it should be a course in undergraduate physics programs? Yes, so, so the way I would see it would be to have several courses. I would say that like clearly one maybe in second year of undergrad. Like, you know, first year programming for sure. And uh, I think now that people in universities do better, but back in my time, like uh, programming class were not that frequent and also not very well organized. Like people teaching C or Fortran to physics students is just stupid. Uh, people should really do Python. Um, mm -hmm. So you should start Python first year, second year do some machine learning. Not, you know, not too advanced, but just get familiar. And then I would say in a master uh, or last year of undergrad in the US, have right. machine learning, but applied on the, on, on your field. Like, you know, so, uh, on second year undergrad, it's just like, you know, machine learning. Uh, but mm -hmm. then you, you need to do also machine learning for your field, which, uh, okay, you know, if you go to theoretical physics, it's like, things are harder, but at least things like uh, application to many body physics, lattice simulations, uh, right. Yeah, very concrete examples applied to physics. So what what you're saying is so uh, okay. So according to my experience in uh, in recent years, uh, e even e even the low ranked universities they do have you know courses on something like MATLAB or Mathematica and computer programming, including Python, in their undergrad programs. So what you're saying is that you can incorporate machine learning in these courses, right? Yeah, I mean, I would split. I would just do one class, general Python, how you just use Python to 
to do scripts, mm -hmm. manipulate data, solve equations, this kind of thing. And then another okay. class just focusing on machine learning and more data science. Okay. And uh, like MATLAB, I think is useless. Uh, I mean, now it's just uh, not guys. Uh, it's okay, maybe useful I for many people. Day, but I hate MATLAB. Huh? It's useful for many people. I know many yeah. people who love MATLAB. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I guess it can depend, but uh, I, I would say most of the things you can do them with Python, with small packages, and it's right. more easy. Yeah. So, okay, it depends right. If you go more to like, work in the lab, okay, MATLAB is great. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, it's uh, okay. Maybe you should have a class, you know, where people can choose between MATLAB and Mathematica. This could make sense. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's also like in Pensar, I don't know if it's better to have one class or maybe, you know, with one, two, three, and uh, where you see all the techniques are kind of split a bit better be between different class to, to make more independence. Mm -hmm. Uh, to see the different techniques. So this, I, I don't really know how I would organize, uh, but definitely I think Python, machine learning, data science, and something like mm -hmm. Mathematica or MATLAB, yes. Okay. So I think my questions are over. Thank you so much for your time. It was great to talk to you. Thanks a lot for uh, everything and uh, the discussion. No, no problem. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And the YouTube algorithm thinks that you will also like this video.